analysis of the recent books, I could mention the age of crisis, neoliberalism, the collapse of democracy and the pandemic in 2022, and progressive policies for economic development in 2021. Currently, Professor Saad Filiu also acts as the vice president of the European Association of Development Institutes, EAD. With these words, uh, warm welcome, Professor Alfredo Saad Filiu. Good afternoon. Um, thanks uh, very much, Professor Bonhuego and the colleagues from the Finnish Society for Development Research. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege for me to be uh, here uh, and particularly important because of the society's celebration of Professor Barry Gill's um, career uh, that we've uh, had um, yesterday. What I would like to do um, today uh, is to start by sharing um, my screen uh, and then to uh, talk to you a bit about um, the current crises in uh, neoliberalism and the possible uh, ways uh, forward. So, um, at the moment, sorry, let me just get organized. This is currently uh, a very important slide for me. Um, it's very um, bleak. Um, but I want to start by agreeing with Barry's uh, statement made yesterday that we are living in a time of crisis. Um, the, but then Barry made the comment that um, all times are times of crisis. I want to make the case that we the moment we are experiencing is uh, special because of the systemic nature of the crises that we are experiencing. And those crises that we see illustrated over there are just some of the crises that we, um, that the global political economy is going through. We have crises of food supply, crises of water supply, we have crises um, across, uh, across the board. What I want to suggest um, is that there is something systemic developing underneath those crises. And what articulates them together is the notion of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism uh, understood as the current phase, the current uh, stage, um, the current configuration of global uh, capitalism. And it is as a crisis of this uh, stage, phase, configuration of global capitalism, that we have a crisis uh, in the economy, uh, in the global economy, marked by a prolonged stagnation, particularly in the advanced economies in the global north, prolonged stagnation, certainly since 2008, and then punctuated, uh, this period punctuated by uh, finance-driven implosions. We have a crisis in, the, in political systems, a crisis that is marked by the erosion of democracy and the rise of new forms of fascism in so many countries around the world. We had just now, uh, just recently, a crisis in health that was clearly visible through the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are other crises in health as well. They take the mental health crises uh, ravaging uh, around uh, the world. There's a crisis of social reproduction that leads to growing pressures within households. There's a crisis of the environment that we saw today uh, in the presentation by Professor Jayati Ghosh uh, that has implications for the existence of life as we uh, know it on this planet. We have geopolitical crises. I don't need to say this for you uh, in, uh, in, in Finland. And that poses a different level of threat to life uh, on Earth. We're going to look at some of these crises today, and I'm going to make the case that they are organically, structurally uh, related through the concepts of neoliberalism and financialization. What started as specific crises, circumscribed crises, they're now merging into a general crisis of global uh, neoliberalism. So, the global political economy was transformed by the rise of neoliberal financialization since the 1970s. Now, in the literature, there are multiple definitions of financialization. Uh, my favorite one, the one that I work with, if we can we eliminate this? 
on the screen. Is that is it possible? Uh, just to make it easier. Um, the one that I work with is the one that you've got uh, on the slide, uh, but it doesn't it, it doesn't matter. Um, what is significant for our purposes now is that financialization is associated with the transfer of state capacity to allocate resources away from the Keynesian state, away from the developmental state, away from Soviet style socialist states into and towards a globally integrated financial system. And this has allowed finance, the financial system, interest bearing capital, whatever you want to call it, allows finance to control the most important sources of capital and the most important levers of economic policy in the majority of relevant countries uh, in the world. So the spread of financialization, the spread of, um, of neoliberalism, um, have led to an extraordinary recovery of profitability since the lows of the rate of profit uh, in uh, the early 1980s. That's the first uh, graph in my um, in in the slide uh, over there. And what you can see in this this is about the United States, but it is uh, representative of the wider capitalist uh, economy around the world. You see a decline in rates of profit uh, since the Second World War bottoming out in the 1980s, and then there's the transition to neoliberalism and profit rates start rising again. You notice the dip uh, with the global financial crisis in 2008, but profits recover relatively rapidly after that. And the second, um, the second picture and the second graph, uh, that is the share of uh, total profits generated in the, the economy that is appropriated by the financial system. Relatively stable in the United States, around 10% uh, of total profits being captured by finance. Um, and with neoliberalism, that share starts rising, peaking above 40% of total profits being captured by finance uh, just before the global financial crisis. The sector crashes completely with the crisis and then recovers uh, to a significant extent uh, after. Uh, after that. So now liberalism and financialization have underpinned the recovery of profitability uh, and rising inequality uh, almost everywhere. I will come back to this. Why rising inequality? Finance is the sector of the economy traditionally with the highest average remuneration. When finance increases its size within the economy, uh, the consequence almost inevitably is an increase in inequality as well. There are other processes, but this is one that is uh, significant. So the next feature, or first feature, important feature of uh, neoliberalism is uh, the, the financialization. The second important feature is the transnationalization of production and of finance uh, itself. And this is about the international integration of circuits of capital at the level of firms. Previously, Production was integrated globally at the level of countries. Countries would produce things and then export those, some of those things and import other things. What you have today is a different process of production that is intertwined across borders, across nations, intertwining not just inputs, but consequently labor processes uh, as well. That is the transnationalization that we whole globalization, it's this, this is different from what existed uh, before. Imports and exports have always existed. Integration of production uh, is typical of neoliberalism. What this has led to, in spite of the promises that were made when uh, in, uh, uh, countries were incentivized to open their borders to global trade and global finance, the, one of the arguments was this is going to lead to global equality, global equalization. If you are a poor country, you're going to grow faster by opening up. But this did not uh, happen, not in general at least. What globalization did lead to was to the creation of new patterns of inequality in the global economy and within countries uh, themselves. And we notice around the world tremendous prosperity for those who were already uh, privileged before uh, and the emergence of new forms of poverty and deprivation uh, around the world. But we and we notice some countries growing relatively fast, particularly China uh, and more recently India, but we do not notice a reduction in global inequality as such. 
Financialization has also created a very strong tendency towards uh, short-termism and towards uh, speculation, a tendency towards a decline in the rate of investment, a tendency towards increasing volatility in the economy, and a tendency towards the decline of productivity growth. And I'm going to come back to this uh, very shortly. And those are failures. Those are failures. And they happened when there were at the same time created by neoliberalism, by the spread of neoliberalism around the world, unprecedentedly favorable conditions for capital accumulation. Everything that neoliberalism wanted 30, 40 years ago, it got. The West won the Cold War, destroyed its opponent. The liberalization of trade, finance, and capital movement for most around in most countries around the world unprecedented support for accumulation by competing states, the ideological hegemony of neoliberalism almost everywhere, neoliberalism becoming the common sense of our age, the decline of almost all traditions of resistance, almost all sources of resistance around the world, tr uh, trade unions, nationalist governments, left-wing parties, left-wing social movements, peasant movements, gone, by and large, gone. The uh, reduction of progressive taxation, the reduction of transfers, the reduction of welfare provision in many countries, if not most countries, the marketization of public services in the name of efficiency and individual responsibility, shifting then the burden of care from the state towards households, and in particular towards women in those households. You give neoliberalism everything it wanted, and what's the consequence? A slowdown in accumulation, uh, especially in the core countries. Between 2008 and 2020, the West suffered the longest calamity and the weakest and the most regressive economic recovery on record that was then followed by the pandemic and uh, subsequently a recovery and now another uh, economic crisis. Um, again, this is what I call the economic paradox of neoliberalism that you achieve absolutely extraordinarily favorable conditions for accumulation and you don't capitalize on them, nothing happens. You get a prolonged economic stagnation. How is that possible? That's why it's a paradox. So everyone knows that GDP growth rates have been falling um, for decades, particularly in the OECD. So neoliberalism didn't create the problem, but it didn't resolve the problem either. In fact, the problem became worse. And there's no doubt that the neoliberal reforms around the world, they have led to the creation of very strong forces towards speculation and towards inequality and forces against investment, against productivity growth, uh, forces against good jobs, against economic well-being, against democracy, uh, with China as a spectacular exception, but only a partial exception to those uh, trends. And the main problem is that financialization has fed a logic of economic extraction and unproductive accumulation and unequalizing accumulation that has undermined whatever had been achieved by previous systems of accumulation in the global north, in the global south, in what used to be the Soviet bloc, and led to the spread of what I like to call stabilization, speculation, stagnation traps uh, around the world. Gabriel Palma shows that if the United States had its current GDP level, but the same, but the same share of uh, the top 1%, uh, the same income share of the top 1% uh, or as it had in 1980, that group of people would earn $2 trillion a year less than they currently do. The two trillion is the shift in distribution of income in the United States. If the distribution of income in the United States has had remained as it was in 1980, the top 1% would now have only half its wealth. The top 0.1% would have one third of its wealth and the top 0.01% would have only one fifth of its wealth. It's a measure of inequality under neoliberalism. That means that the top 1% in the United States would own $20 trillion less than they currently do. The other side of this coin is the decline in investment. 
if the share of investment in US GDP had remained the same as it was in 1980, you, the US economy would be investing $1 trillion per year more than it currently does. These figures are also from Gabriel Palmer, and this one shows the share of investment in proportion to the income of the top 10% uh, in the United States. Today, non-residential private investment in the United States barely covers depreciation. No wonder that the bridges are falling down and the roads are going to ruin in the US. And productivity growth has declined so much that if the United States had kept its pre, this is just a thought experiment, had kept its pre-neoliberal productivity growth rate, its current GDP would be $10 trillion higher today than it actually is. And it's not just a US problem. Look at Germany, that in the early 2000s, deliberately moved into the construction of inequality in its own economy, building up an extremely badly paid working class that is perhaps 20% of the population now. In doing this, Germany managed not only to change its social structure, but also to converge with Latin American levels of inequality and to converge with Latin American rates of low investment and low productivity growth. Germany, paradoxically, became almost, almost a Latin American economy. And this tension between inequality and investment is not just about the US and Germany, it covers several most advanced economies today. In Latin America, just for comparison, the share of investment in GDP started from a very low level of 22% in, in the 1970s, fell by another 3% since 1980. Even though the region opened itself up to international capital flows and captured $3.6 trillion uh, in constant values of 2019, it didn't grow as a result of that. In fact, it stagnated almost everywhere Inequality increased under neoliberalism, investment fell, productivity growth fell. So much for the propensity of capitalists to invest and to accumulate. Where is it? The decline in GDP growth since 1980 in Western Europe, in Latin America, was entirely caused by the decline of productivity growth. And that fell in both regions, Western Europe and the US, uh, fell from about 3% per year to zero. And this was self-inflicted. Since 1980, labor productivity has tripled in Indonesia and Malaysia, quadrupled in Thailand, multiplied by five in South Korea, Taiwan and Vietnam, multiplied by six in India and multiplied by 20 in China. In the meantime, the US lost half its manufacturing jobs and Western Europe lost one third of its jobs. Okay, let's have a look at what happened um, in terms of inequality, um, particularly in the advanced economies. And again, I'm going to use the US as my main example. This is um, what Piketty illustrated as the U-shaped curve for four Anglo-Saxon uh, economies. This is the share of the um, top 1% in the distribution of income in those four countries. And we notice that at the beginning of the 20th century, the top 1% would get maybe perhaps 20% uh, of total income. It went down dramatically in the middle of the 20th century. That's the, that's the welfare state. Uh, that's progressive taxation. That is redistribution. And then under neoliberalism, we return to uh, an economy that we had seen last time at the beginning of the 20th century, an economy with a much higher level of concentration uh, of income. Exactly the picture for the United States. Um, this is the share of the top 1% uh, with uh, or without under and with uh, above uh, capital gains. Uh, of course, the rich concentrate most financial assets. They get most of the capital gains. The counterpart to the deterioration of, this, of the distribution of income in the United States is the decline in the wage share of national income. That has declined by at least five percentage points in an economy the size of the United States, that is several trillion dollars. Remember the trillions of dollars that were, are now captured by the top 1%, they are coming from somewhere. And if we look at 
if I can find my, yes, thank you. Productivity growth in the US economy is relatively constant. It's about 2.5 to 2.75% uh, per annum every year since the since the Second World War, since, since we've got data. So it's, this is basically a straight line. The purple line is basically straight. And the, the bottom line, real wage uh, line, from the end of the Second World War to about 19, middle of 1970, early 1973, that the two lines are absolutely parallel, meaning distribution of income was relatively constant. Productivity was rising, wages, real wages are rising in exactly the same rhythm. So the distribution of income in the US was constant. Come 1972-73, the line has an inflection, real wages stopped growing in the United States. They recovered more recently, started rising more recently, but this gap here remains absolutely huge. Now, if real wages are relatively constant, how is it that household income has been rising a bit, but has been rising a bit? Why? Because households have been working longer hours. This is retired people going back to the job market. This is students going into the job market when they wouldn't have to go before. This is uh, housewives leaving the, the house and, and, and taking a job, et cetera. More hours of work by the household. But the point is, if real wages per hour are constant and productivity is rising, who's getting this difference here? Who's getting the additional product? Remember the trillions of dollars that we were talking about uh, before. Now. You can cut this in different ways. If you cut the salaries uh, the, and look at the distribution of salaries within the US economy, you notice that the lower your income level is, the more stagnant your wage tends to be. It can be growing in a negative direction. But if you go towards the highest salaries in the economy, the top 10%, for example, the red line, then those salaries have been rising quite comfortably. This is again a picture of inequality. So you have inequality between capital and labor. You have inequality within labor uh, as well uh, in the US uh, economy. You can continue to cut this. You can look at uh, years of schooling and the less years of schooling uh, you've got, the lower your salary tends to go. The more years of schooling you have, the more your salary tends to rise. If you think that years of schooling are, connect, are related to uh, family wealth, because rich people can normally afford to stay in education for longer, then you have a perpetuation of inequality and the construction of even more inequality within the labor force. If you look at the racial uh, implications of this within the US economy, that's a picture of continuing, if not growing, inequality as well uh, within uh, the, US, um, the US economy. And on top of this, you have a tendency particularly under neoliberalism, for tax rates for the rich to decline and for the tax system to become less and less progressive and to become, at times, especially regressive. So tax rates for the rich started coming down in the 1970s, 1980s. The final step here is the Trump uh, tax uh, um, reductions. It was the first thing that Donald Trump did when he uh, was elected president, making it such that the top, the 400 richest Americans pay less tax as a proportion of income than the bottom half of the United States. That's the end of progressive taxation uh, in that uh, economy. And if you remember uh, the first picture, we saw how this the distribution of income improved during the welfare state. That is a testament for the effectiveness of tax policy to equalize incomes in society. It's exactly the opposite of this engine of inequality that we have uh, here. And the consequence is that the top uh, of society, the top 1%, the top 10%, the top 0.1%, the top 0.01% accumulates more and more wealth while the bottom of society, in this case, uh, the bottom 50%, uh, doesn't accumulate anything. Again, a picture of growing inequality in, in the US economy. How do we make sense of this and what are the consequences? This, these changes in uh, the distribution of income and then the consequently the distribution of wealth had implications for the distribution of power uh, as well in that economy. But this is connected via the restructuring of the economy uh, in the US and in other parts of the world under neoliberalism. 
a dramatic economic restructuring associated in particular with global trade, uh, in the, the globalization of trade and deindustrialization that created an array of citizens that I call for simplicity economic losers, the people who lost out economically under neoliberalism. And this is relatively easy to consider when you think of the United States, but also the UK and a number of other uh, uh, European countries that have deindustrialized significantly in the past uh, decades. Millions of skilled jobs have been eliminated, especially in the advanced economies under neoliberalism. Whole professions disappeared because of technology or were exported. Employment opportunities in the public sectors always also dried up because of privatizations and because of the retrenching of government itself. Job stability declined almost everywhere. Pay has tended to be eroded as we saw. Con pay, um, conditions of work and, and, and welfare provision have tended to deteriorate. At the same time as neoliberalism pushes to everyone the notion that your worth as a human being, as a member of society, is entirely dependent on your income and on your consumption pattern. At the same time as it does not provide the conditions for you to satisfy those sometimes le perfectly legitimate ones. I want a house. I want means of transportation. I want, I want to dress decently. I want to have basic things in life. Or the other things that are uh, put uh, to you as markers of a good life, things that you must consume in order to be considered by others as a worthy uh, citizen, a worthy member of uh, society. There are legitimate material aspirations and there are induced aspirations, difficult to define in practice, but we see the, the conceptual distinction. But even more severe than this, even more urgent perhaps, is the realization that now, now, for the first time, in the history of capitalism. For the first time in 400 years of capitalism, the young generation will not achieve the same uh, economic prosperity as their parents had. For the first time in the history of capitalism, you can no longer say as a parent, I sacrificed myself. I'm humiliated at my work. I was fired, but I'll continue to, to try hard to find another job. I will have two jobs. I'll have three jobs. I will provide for my children so that they can do better than I am doing. You can't say that anymore because your children, statistically in general, will not do as well as you did. It's the first time. This undermines the legitimacy, not just of neoliberalism, it undermines the legitimacy of capitalism itself because the ideology of constant improvement across generations is very important to validate the mode of production. And it has been important since the 18th century, uh, at least. Now, if you look at the picture of neoliberalism in other parts of the world, it's exactly the same. Chile is particularly dramatic. Chile was the first country uh, to turn to a, a, a form of governance, economic policy, mode of existence of capitalism uh, that we would recognize ex post as being neoliberal with the uh, Pinochet coup in 1973. This um, figure covers approximately the period uh, in which General Pinochet was uh, the main political leader in Chile. The, this is exactly the same as we saw in the case of the United States. Accumulation, if your income is in the top 10%, it's increased by 50% in the period between 73 and 87. The poorer you are, the more uh, you lost. A picture of inequality. What were the processes generating those distributional outcomes? That is a question for us as social scientists, a question that I'm not going to answer now uh, in a direct way. Uh, what I want to do now is to look at neoliberalism historically. And if we look at neoliberalism historically, we can identify three periods in the age of neoliberalism that we are experiencing now. The first period goes on until about uh, the mid-1990s, and then the second period until the mid um, the global financial crisis, and then a third period uh, since then. The first period is a period of transition, what I like to call the shock phase of neoliberalism. When countries shift towards neoliberalism, 
there is an aggressive promotion of private capital with very little concern with the consequences. This is to make neoliberalism an established fact on the ground. That's the moment of reform. Very forceful state intervention to contain labor, to destroy the left effective almost everywhere. If, uh, strong state intervention to promote the transnational integration of capital and finance and to put in place the new institutional framework, a historical phase that circles around the world and is completed with the East Asian crisis in the mid 1990s. At that point, Western Europe was basically neoliberal, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, etc. Basically, most of the world was neoliberal. This then comes the second phase, um, when neoliberalism was already a fact in the ground in most countries. The second phase is the third wave phase, the mature phase of neoliberalism. Is the first if the first phase of neoliberalism is associated with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, the second phase is associated with Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, Gerhard Schroeder. It's a phase of consolidation. It's a phase of securing the hegemony of finance in social uh, and economic reproduction. It's a phase of state management of the new modalities of international integration. It's a phase of creation of the WTO. It's a phase of the new treaties, the new international treaties to consolidate neoliberalism um, both nationally and internationally. It's a phase of rolling out social policies to control, to mitigate the poverty, the deprivation that had been created by the neoliberal transition uh, itself. And it was very importantly, the phase of consolidation of the neoliberal subjectivity. The moment when neoliberalism is not just a fact in the ground out there, is the phase when neoliberalism is a fact in our minds. That is when you accept neoliberalism. This, this is what it is. This is what the world is. This is what the world should be. I think in those terms, it's a colonization of the mind. So at that point, there was no more space for the traditional opposition, for the traditional left, both because, well, because society had changed, because the left had been uh, destroyed and lost popularity and appeal. And most people did not believe in it anymore. They believed in neoliberalism. And then we have the global financial crisis. And the global financial crisis opens the third phase of neoliberalism, a phase of loss of legitimacy. So, oi, I give you everything you want. And what do you deliver? The worst crisis since 1929? I give you everything that you've ever wanted as neoliberalism. You conquer everything you, you ever wanted. And then what? You, have, you create poverty. And then as a consequence of that poverty, you have economic instability and low growth. And then you spend trillions of dollars salvaging the banks, the banks, not building houses, not building hospitals, not promoting social welfare, but salvaging the rich from what they created because they had all the power to drive economic policy. What is that's loss of legitimacy? People are stunned. That is in 2012. Uh, Piketty launches capital in the 21st century, a book that denounced, that diagnosed and denounced the growing inequality and the neoliberalism, and a book that had mass appeal. I myself realized that at very late, the book is thick, the book is difficult, it's a book for economists, it's hard to read, and the book was being sold in airports. And when a book is being sold at, at, at an airport, you know that it has mass appeal and people were buying that book. Non-economists were buying that book. It captured the moment when people realized, hey, there's something wrong about this. There's something wrong about the way in which we are living. There's something wrong about neoliberalism. Okay, let's look at politics. Now, history shows a uh, whole range of paths of transition to neoliberalism. They can be authoritarian, Pinochet in Chile, uh, Videla in Argentina, um, the generals uh, in Turkey. They can be authoritarian, but democratic in form, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Ronald Reagan, or neoliberalism can come together with transitions to democracy, Brazil, South Africa, South Korea, across uh, Eastern Europe. Many different paths of transition, but they all converged in the 1990s into a common T 
typical democratic political form associated with neoliberalism in the 1990s, neoliberal democracies. Democracy is a historical construct and democracy is different over time. The Victorian democracies, the welfare democracies, social democratic uh, regimes uh, in Western Europe uh, in the post-war period and the neoliberal democracies that we have uh, today. Neoliberal democracies are circumscribed. Democracy always includes some and excludes others. What are the neoliberal democracies including and excluding? They are including neoliberal thought and institutions and they lock in the um, economic policies and institutions responsible for perpetuating neoliberalism. They insulate economic policy from any form of possible interference by the majority. Uh, structures that dramatically reduce the policy space uh, for neoliberal states and for any form of legitimate opposition. European Union as a classic example, as a template. European Central Bank. Who can change the policies of the European Central Bank? No one. They are unchangeable and consequently unchangeable across the continent uh, as well. If there is no alternative economic policy, there is no choice. So there's no scope to debate the economy. There's no need to waste time debating the economy. If you evacuate the economic, very important area of social reproduction, if you evacuate the economic from the political debate, what is it that is going to fill the space? Culture, religion, nationalism, racism. That's what's going to fill the political space. And then you say, oh, what happened? We're now talking about nationalism in a way that we did since the 1920s. Well, it's your fault. You evacuated the political space. There is no way to change the economy and people are not happy with it. What are they going to do? What do you expect them to do? This process of conservative um, radicalization that we see compounded and the institutional rigidity that we see compounded the feeling of alienation of the economic losers under neoliberalism. The collectivity of the workers have been defeated. The uh, class politics has been defeated. The left has been defeated. How do the losers frame their disappointments, their resentments, their fears, their hopes? They do that through the ethics of, ne ethics of neoliberalism itself. An individualist ethic of conflict between insiders and outsiders. That's the projection that you get from the mass media in particular. The perception then that dominates is that our group is being surrounded, the system doesn't work because our group is being attacked. It's surrounded and being attacked by predatory non-members of the group. And then within the group, us as honest, hardworking people are being besieged by dishonest characters within ourselves. Our values uh, of honesty and hard work are undermined by politicians that steal our money, even though we voted for them, by immigrants that crowd us out of our houses, our hospitals, even though the immigrants build those houses and hospitals, clean them and staff them. And we are being robbed by different countries around the world, poorer countries than ourselves that steal our jobs, even though we exported that we as an economy exported the jobs to them and then we buy the products that they uh, produce. So the political paradox of neoliberalism is that the institutionalization of neoliberal democracy ended up undermining the foundations of democracy itself. The structures of political representation became unresponsive. Public policy became increasingly indifferent to the majority. I don't care what you feel. You can't change anything, so whatever. I don't, I don't care. The state signaled that collectivities based on class would not be recognized anymore, and that cash poor individuals were either failures or they were crooks, and they had to be contained. Now, with the destruction of the left in the previous period, those Tensions led to uh, a response that was driven by anti-systemic forces that are polarized by what I like to call spectacular authoritarian leaders. Spectacular because they perform in the arena of the spectacle of the mass media and social media. And this happened in the global north and in the global south in different ways uh, in each case. These leaders are supposedly strong people 
They cultivate a politics of resentment. They appeal to common sense constantly, common sense in the traditional philosophical uh, sense. They claim the ability to get things done by force of will because they are strong uh, individuals. They promise to defeat a hostile state and the outsiders that undermine our nation and harm our people. Project, if you don't have collective agency, project your agency on me and I will resolve your problem. And then when those leaders achieve power, they systematically, they are neoliberal. They systematically impose policies that intensify neoliberalism, normally under the veil of nationalism and a more or less explicit racism, depending on the circumstances. And as they rise, what we also notice is the growth of more or less fascist movements to their extreme right growing at the same time. So the political crisis of neoliberalism that we see today is not about Donald Trump. Donald Trump got 3 million votes less than Hillary Clinton, got 7 million votes uh, votes less than uh, Biden. It's not about Brexit. Brexit won at the margin. I'm going to illustrate that. And without any possibility of agreement of what the vote was for, it's not even about the individual authoritarian neoliberal leaders that we find today. What we have is a systemic crisis of representation in the neoliberal system of accumulation, leading to what I'm calling a paradox of authoritarianism. These crises, the economic crisis of neoliberalism, the political crisis of neoliberalism, feed the space for those authoritarian political leaders. They come into power. They don't resolve problems because they can't resolve problems. They are neoliberal. Neoliberalism created those problems. What do they do? They perform. They identify enemies, they create conflict within the society and with other societies, they create conflicts constantly and cannot stop performing, otherwise they lose votes and people realize that they're not resolving problems. So you're constantly stressing society to maintain your popularity and because they're of their commitment to the expansion of their own personal uh, power. But the measures that they actually take harm their political base constantly. So they must radicalize continuously in order to maintain the, um, the popular base that legitimizes uh, them. So new resentments and new conflicts constantly, they can't stop, they can only perform. And in the meantime, a fringe, a fascist fringe claims to be able to resolve the problems of the inside group with more coherence than those big political leaders who, after all, only perform. So my claim is that authoritarian neoliberalism is intrinsically unstable and its internal dynamics will give increasing prominence and scope for the far right to grow. And there is a growing space for new forms of fascism to uh, emerge. Let me illustrate this point very briefly. Um, with the Brexit referendum in the UK that I think translates uh, quite well the, um, some of the arguments that I'm trying to make. The Brexit referendum in 2016 was won by 52 to 48%. Uh, percent. You, if, if you decompose the vote and examine who voted for what, it was especially the white working class and male voters with less years of education, less financial means, and greater nostalgia for the British Empire that voted for Brexit with no agreement and no possibility of agreement of what they were voting for. It was clear what they were voting against, but no idea of what they were voting for, and it would have been impossible to find agreement. So there's a continuing agitation in the country that is supposedly nationalist for several years, leading to the conclusion that Brexit has a social base. This is the social base, social base of the economic losers and the neoliberalism, even though it does not have a material basis, but it does have a social basis that gives it popularity. The consequence of that is political instability, ever more short-termist governments and continuing political crisis in the country. This is what we have until about 2000 and early 2020. And then we have the pandemic. What the pandemic did was, Nothing much. The pandemic 
uh, did not change anything fundamentally. It intensified those tensions. The economy was doing badly, it collapsed entirely. Political systems were drifting towards authoritarianism, and in the pandemic, the more authoritarian um, governments tended often to become spectacularly perverse, imposing health policies that killed millions of people and that entrenched COVID-19 so it can never again, never be eliminated. It could have been eliminated back in 2020. It was not because of a sequence of political uh, decisions that were made in the United States, in the UK, in India, in Brazil, in other countries uh, that took the lead in addressing the policy in strictly neoliberal terms. We can talk about oh, the pandemic in strictly neoliberal terms. We can talk about that. Hold that. Let me look at this from another angle. We have known since Marx that the working class has been separated, not just from the means of production, but also from the means of life. It starts with land, but it includes housing, transport, food, healthcare, everything. You have access, but access is conditional and it is mediated by paid employment, access to anything that makes life comfortable or even possible. So in capitalism in general and in neoliberalism, neoliberalism specifically, most people have a fundamental interest in securing the means of life to live lives with less stress, less anxiety, less unfreedom. 66% of the US population worries about accessing basic health care. 31% were struggling to pay their energy bills even before the most recent energy price spike. 60 to 80% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. In 2018, 40% of Americans could not cover a $400 emergency expense. These numbers are exactly the same in the UK and perhaps in other countries uh, as well. In the poor countries, of course, they'll be uh, much worse. Now, Nancy Fraser, Chithi Bhattacharya, and Cynthia Ruta have stressed for us what need not be stressed, but it's good to remember the white, the, the, the global working class is not just about white men working in factories. The majority of the workers works in fields, works in private homes, works in offices, in hotels, in bars, in restaurants, in delivery services, hospitals, uh, schools, particularly at the precarious end of the working class. The, work, the global working class is disproportionately female, migrant, and racialized, and there, in those experiences, that is where the global north actually meets the global south. And this is particularly acute under neoliberalism because low paid precarious service work has tended to replace secure unionized industrial labor in most countries, particularly in the advanced economies. And we know that wages have tended to stagnate almost everywhere. Now, the consequence uh, in the North and in the South is that workers, workers have tended and working class households have tended to take on uh, multiple jobs and borrow to survive while at the same time, because of the retreat of the welfare state, they have to take more and more responsibilities at home, generating a crisis of care that particularly exhausts uh, women, that damages families, that strains people's capacities. No wonder we have a mental health crisis today, but that will be another story that we can't discuss. Now, and these are frustrations that have helped to feed right-wing movements that identify real problems in neoliberalism, but then twist the grievances to blame poorer countries, to blame the weakest and the least protected members of society, and then deflect blame away from capital and from profit. Let me comment. Um, on the next crisis today, the crisis of the environment. And we saw uh, uh, Jayati Ghosh's outstanding presentation uh, this morning. Uh, we have known for several decades, at least since the Second World War, that the consumption of fossil fuels, you can go back to the 19th century, but these are mostly uh, marginal people. From the Second World War, uh, up to now, it's absolutely established science. We know that the consumption of fossil fuels generates greenhouse gases that can raise global uh, temperatures. And this has been examined in a whole number of um, materials, including and especially IPCC uh, reports. We are now at 1.5 degrees. Um, 
for a whole year consecutively. Uh, for the first time, the projections are that global temperatures will rise by four to seven degrees um, in the next hundred years. And global warming is already having a whole range of uh, consequences, consequences that affect um, poor people and poor countries in particular, because poor people and poor countries are more vulnerable to any form of economic uh, disturbance. The argument that I want to make is that the challenge of leaving fossil fuels in the ground, which we have to, the challenges of diversifying energy supplies, of securing macroeconomic stability and sustainability, the challenges of improving the distribution of income, wealth, and power, they have to be addressed simultaneously, not in sequence, simultaneously for reasons of legitimacy, of practicality, and of effectiveness. The point is that those transitions, the energy transition in particular, will have costs. And the only way to bring public support is to couple the energy transition with the reversal of the excluding logic of neoliberalism. The, this is the only way to bring consensus to this transition. What, where does climate change come from? It comes from five sources of stress in the global economy. First is the contradiction between the fact that the Earth is finite and has a limited capacity to sustain a stable climate, in contradiction with the infinite search for profits under neoliberalism and the tendency of capitalism to plunder nature for energy and raw materials and to use the Earth as a sink for production and consumption waste. This means that carbon emissions are not an unfortunate externality that can be priced away by clever uh, policies, by governments. This is a necessary and inevitable aspect of accumulation and profitability. And at the same time as capitalism increases our capacity, our possibilities of consumption, it also uses more and more machinery and more raw materials and then inevitably generates more waste. There is no escape from this. So capitalism intrinsically destabilizes the ecosystem, first problem. Second problem is the tension between the awareness of the environmental uh, limits to growth, which, which we have as a society, we have had for decades, and the inability of governments and intergovernmental organizations to do anything about it. Despite all the talk, all the flying around, all the uh, COP meetings, all the governmental negotiations, CO2 emissions rose from 20,000 megatons in 1990 to 37,000 megatons last year. They are still rising. The emissions in a small number of advanced economies have declined, but that's more because of their deindustrialization and the shift of manufacturing production to the global south, uh, much more than uh, for any uh, other uh, reasons. And that this transfer of manufacturing production to the south is even worse for the climate because it implies that you have to transport goods um, back to the global north. But even if the CO2 uh, emissions uh, reductions in the best performing countries, Cuba, Denmark, Spain, Sweden, etc., could be replicated, the world would still not achieve even the two degree upper limit agreed in Paris. Third problem, the tension between, which that Jayati explored this morning, the tension between the accumulated emission by the advanced Western economies and the rising emissions in developing countries saying, you developed on the basis of pollution, what do you want us to do? We're going to grow as well. You're not going to stop us. And that is a perfectly legitimate argument. What are you going to say in response to that? Fourth problem, the structure of the global economy, where several countries are heavily invested in the production of fossil fuels, even though the extraction of those fuels uh, and their processing are completely unsustainable. What are you going to do with your capital stock? And that's a major problem for a number of poor economies. And all those tensions have been intensified by financialization. Financialization tends to raise emissions, even though the financial institutions know everything about climate change. They know everything about the need to strand productive assets and oil, uh, and oil fields and gas fields and coal mines. They know everything about that. They're still funding more oil extraction facilities, more refineries and more coal mines because financial institutions operate in the short term. Your bonus at the end of the year and your job depend on deals that you have to sign. And these are the realistic deals on the table. 
So you sign those deals and the financial institutions continue to fund the destruction of the atmosphere. This is completely activities of finance in the way they are framed today, are completely incompatible with climate adaptation, with transformative industrial policies, with uh, the redistribution of income. What I want to suggest is that these challenges of diversifying energy supplies, leaving fossil fuels in the ground, maintaining economic stability and sustainability, and redistributing income, wealth, and power have to be addressed together by what I'm calling a democratic economic uh, strategy. And I've done some work in this area. There's much more that needs to be done. I will not have time to discuss this today, but if anyone is interested, we can talk about it later, or you can send me an email and I can send you uh, papers. And the idea is to develop a set of economic policies that responds to five uh, imperatives in five areas of debate. First is recognition that mass poverty and climate change are both urgent problems and they both have to be addressed by pu public policy, whatever the cost and whatever the profitability. Second principle is that democratic development uh, must benefit the poor more than the rich. Growth is democratic only when it reduces both absolute poverty and relative poverty at the same time. Third principle is that a democratic economic strategy must protect the environment and the living conditions of the majority of the population. We have to release investment and production from the straitjacket of profitability and competition. Investment and production have to be socially coordinated to focus on immediate decarbonization regardless of cost or profit, this is about life or death. For If not for our generation, for our children's generation. The fourth goal uh, is, or the fourth uh, uh, principle is that a democratic uh, strategy has to be pursued directly and its outcomes have to be measured directly. They cannot be indirect or conditional on trickle down, conditional on profit seeking or conditional on the interests of finance. No mediations. The outcome is what you want the outcome to be. And fifth uh, principle is that a democratic economic strategy has to be inserted within a democratic political process. Now there's a whole number of consequences from those principles that I can't discuss uh, here, but the point is that the costs and the sacrifices of the energy transition can gain legitimacy and secure public support only if they are coupled with the reversal of neoliberalism. And only the state can implement this alternative economic strategy because it will be necessary to exercise coercive authority against those people who wish to maintain the status quo. Only the state can deliver the energy transition in a coordinated way. Only the state can euthanize the rentiers, as Keynes nicely put it. Only the state can decommodify social reproduction, definancialize the economy, dismantle the fossil fuel industry, the most powerful lobby in the world. Only the state can fund a new energy system. Only the state can lead the retrofitting of our mode of living. No state will do this without massive pressure from below. The challenge that we have as a generation and as social scientists is to uh, articulate those movements and to convince masses of people in the global north and in the global south that they have an immediate material interest in restructuring production to make a livable future possible. And this needs to come with the promise of more security and a more worthwhile life for the poor people, insecure people uh, uh, in the world as part of the strategy of change. We as academics, we have an absolutely key role in the process because through our work, through our interests, through our contacts, through our expertise and our experience, we straddle north and south and we can help to cross fertilize experiences in ways that are quite uh, unique. Let me close. Development policies um, are, come out of experiences and uh, we as uh, development studies, global studies, um, academics, 
uh, and always uh, students, we have to be critical, uh, particularly in times of crisis. If we are not critical, then all our science becomes justification for the status quo, becomes justification for exploitation, justification for the reproduction of inequality within countries and between countries, and justification and excuses for the destruction of the conditions of life on Earth. What we are facing today is a modality of capitalism that has uh, its own prosperity relying increasingly on despoliation, on extraction, and on fraud, that, and that is sliding into a permanent economic crisis, fascism, and environmental collapse. It is absolutely urgent as a task for the generation to advance a transformative uh, agenda. A transformative agenda uh, drawing upon uh, the notions of democracy in the political domain, an expansion of democracy in the political domain, the restoration of a collective sphere of citizenship, the expansion of rights, the distribution of income, of wealth, and of power, and focusing on the decommodification and definancialization of social reproduction, I suggest starting with universal public services, and at the same time, a green transition in the economy. The trouble is that those alternatives need to be backed up as the only way forward, need to be backed up by organized social movements and new forms of political representation for the majority through new political parties, new trade unions, new community associations that correspond to the mode of existence of a society that has been extensively decomposed and disarticulated domestically, that is integrating itself internationally, but only in very imperfect ways, a global society that has distinct cultures, but is also connected through internet-based tools. We have seen important successes and new movements emerging, but we are nowhere near the, um, the position we need to be uh, yet. And I think, and I'll close on this, there's nothing more important right now than to build those movements to reshape our mode of existence in poor countries and in rich countries too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Saad Filiu. Very powerful, very topical. Uh, I'm sure this will raise many comments and questions from the audience. Uh, which uh, I will discuss soon with the organizers if we have time for that. But in the meanwhile, I invite here short five-minute uh, commentary from uh, our own uh, Markus Kröger, who is Professor of Global Development Studies here at the University of Helsinki. Welcome, Markus. Thank you for the invitation and thanks, Alfredo, for this great talk. So I will be brief. Um, yeah, this reminded me a little bit of the uh, argument already, I think, in 2003 by David Harvey and his new imperialism about the, how neoliberalism should be defined principally as this new class inequality, and uh, instead of some other phase of defining it uh, that had been quite popular in the 90s, focusing on other aspects of neoliberalism, and then also of the work of Polanyi. Um, who also said that you know liberalism led to the world war, second world war, first world war, and there seem to, seem to be the same kind of arguments in your presentation: the rise of a new right wing uh, nationalist tendencies due to this inequality and the great argument about the evacuation of the of the political space, uh, you know, of the economic arguments, and then that's the space being filled with the. Uh, nationalist arguments and so on. But then maybe the major <clears throat> issue I had to be just to be provocative. So if you consider that there wouldn't have been this rise of neoliberalism since 1980s, what would have happened? Like, where would we be now in terms of the climate crisis, for example? What do you think? I mean, um, <clears throat> would we be in a similar situation? Would the situation, could, could it even be worse? I mean, if the GDP had grow, grown more because there was less of this capture, rentierism, financialization, if there had been more industrial 
production, productivity, uh, division of wealth, uh, consumerism, would we be even in a worse situation? Just to be provocative, I know that it's not so straightforward, and there are many studies showing that, the, especially the neoliberal periods and authoritarian neoliberal regimes, like in Chile and so on, have created these environmental problems. But you know, just the macro scale, because that also refers to the possible solutions to these issues. Like, can it uh, maybe it cannot be the same thing as after the Second World War, kind of like a New Deal, even not like a Green New Deal, because there are so many problems with the so-called green transition in the practical level when you go to do case studies, uh, you know, the impossibilities of trying to continue the growth without major problems if it's happening in the same way. So what could be an alternative to solve this puzzle and these problems and to, to kind of uh, the, the imminent and urgent problem maybe of, of uh, maybe um, the rising interstate wars, uh, which in, in their place are likely to worsen the climate crisis because then the commodity prices increase like they have now done already with the COVID and the Ukraine war and other wars, uh, which then increases the climate and biodiversity crisis when commodity crisis prices increase, which also feed the financial system like we saw in the 2008 financial crisis that <clears throat> the whole process of land grabbing started, resource grabbing globally. After that financial crisis, then the uh, lands and resources, natural resources, become like a new capital asset class where the global investors really started to look into like a new commodity consensus, commodity paradigm. Fi loads of financing went into these big uh, mining companies and so on. Uh, so it's it's kind of like a perverse system in a way that even the shocks that it creates, this authoritarian neoliberal capitalism, tend to benefit the speculation within that and the the, the, the highest 0.0.01% in there. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, because of this inbuilt system where the crisis feeds the actually the accumulation. So, so the, that's maybe something that if you could comment on those issues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And um... While Alfredo could come here and prepare to respond to Marcus, let's also take three to four other questions and you can then answer all of them at the same time. Let's start with Barry. Who else wants to go? Usman, Taru, and fourth one, then Bon. Yeah. Ready? Thank you, Alfredo. I think that was the best, most brilliant magisterial overview of this I've ever heard. Now then, but you never use the word oligarchy or oligarchization for the inexorable hyper-concentration of capital nationally and globally that has occurred through the neoliberal economic globalization phases that you so aptly described and, I, and then their relationship to state capture by the oligarchic class who have transnationalized their capital, as you said, that's what it is. Their overwhelming social power, the empire of capital that they've built, and they control the states. That is actually historically a recapitulation of what happened in the denouement of democracy in the polities of the ancient Greco-Roman world. There was a massive increase of commercialization of slavery, of the exploitation of labor, the elimination of the peasant class, uh, the growth of wealth of the uh, rentier class and the highest class, concentrating more and more wealth in parasitic accumulation. They captured the magistrates, magistrates re rewrote the constitutions, kept them only formal in form for a while, and then destroyed them all in the imperium of Rome. And it's repeating itself again, isn't it? The, the end point of neoliberalism is authoritarianism. Discuss. All right, and next was Usman. Yeah, so uh, Professor Saad, my question regarding like uh, the outline that you draw on the democratic economic strategy and your em emphasis on state or the role of state in there. I mean, in many parts of the global south, state is the form of colonization, right? State in, has those processes and those uh, kind of structures inbuilt in it. And kind of, you know, the 
debate between Bakunin and Marx on the role, like what possibly could come out of even the if the state is, you know, uh, constituent of uh, labor, even then it can become Stalinism, right? So the state has these kind of problematic things. So how do you see like, you know, state becoming more uh, kind of, I don't know, like progressive in those terms? Thank you. Excellent, and then Taro, please. Uh, yes, I have just the opposite question. Like um, I'm China scholar and this raised some uh, thoughts about what's going on in China where populist uh, authoritarian is definitely on rise. But at the same time, there is a very uh, big push for um, a climate policy uh, that, and uh, very sort of, sort of like China uh, doubled its solar uh, solar production of solar, solar uh, power last year. So in one year only, and it was not low before. Uh, but then you need a strong state that authoritarianism might be able to um, uh, employ. And so you said, and may, I think it's probably true for us here, that these uh, different different questions, neoliberalism, climate, uh, uh, and political populism, need needs to be uh, like um, solved together, a basis of them solved together. But could there be alternatives where you can uh, actually solve uh, solve not all of them, but some? And then the last last question from the association's president, Vaughn, please. Yeah, thanks. As always, thought provoking uh, Alfredo and somehow inspiring. Uh, my question is, how do you communicate with the youth and students? Because uh, you know, I just attended the uh, the Occupy Movements uh, uh, working group. Um, I say this because I was like them when I was a student, when I was younger. But at the same time, I'm thinking about how Barry closed his keynote. Yeah, Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And then you said that, uh, that we must build movements. And then your analysis is that the children and youth of today won't anymore have the level of material security that their parents used to have, yeah? But at the same time, you say we have to build movements and now you are proposing the importance of the state. Giati Ghosh also mentioned about um, progressive voices have existed, but no political traction. And I've been reminded about the trajectory that uh, uh, Barry Gill's uh, colleagues in the 80s and 90s did. They were scholars. They were thinking about social movement politics, but uh, the thought of capturing the state has never existed before. You know, how do you communicate that? Walden Bellio, as an intellectual, decided to really uh, participate in electoral uh, politics. Joel Rocomora also, uh, the co-author of... Uh, Barry Gills in law intensity democracy. So, you know, uh, does it come with age? And how do you communicate with uh, with uh, with the with the youth and the students uh, about all this? Uh, you know, there's some contradiction, but the the dynamics or dialectics of these uh, factors and uh, circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, these are extremely difficult questions. I will try to uh, answer what I can um, very rapidly, uh, but probably not um, probably not everything. What would have happened if um, there hadn't been uh, neoliberalism? Uh, there's, a, there's a hypothetical question with the number of hypotheticals underpinning it. Uh, productivity growth was declining under the Keynesian uh, period. Inflation was rising. Unemployment was rising. Some kind of resolution would have to come out. Imagine it had been possible a resolution towards uh, towards the left. No, I'm not talking about uh, communist revolutions or anything like that, but some form of 
Keynesian social democracy a bit more radical than what actually happened. Think uh, Meidner plan in Sweden or think uh, other um, left wing options at that time. I would imagine that in this entirely hypothetical experiment here, there would have been a greater awareness uh, of uh, climate change sooner because voices, uh, wise voices within the scientific community would not have been stifled and there would have been social debate about the possibility of alternatives and then we would uh, have states with the planning capacity and the implementation capacity and the resourcing capacity to push forward uh, a green transition much earlier, decades uh, earlier. Uh, it is possible to achieve success. We've achieved success with CFCs, for example, very, very rapidly. It was an emergency. It was perceived to be a limited problem. It was, boom, it was, uh, it was uh, resolved. Uh, the green transition is a completely different thing. The uh, Green New Deal, is it is it viable in the way that it is planned? It's not because it's not in the case of the US, of US policy under, under Biden. It's not because it's not a, a Green Deal. It's an industrial policy uh, deal or project in order to compete with China. So it's not a serious take on uh, climate change. It is a, a serious take on uh, on China. Um, wars and crises, yes, wars uh, consume huge amounts of uh, energy. The military are one of the greatest emitters uh, of CO2 uh, in the world. Wars create price shocks uh, and they stress the financial system and open space for speculation. This is a disaster, but it, it is also more likely to become uh, present in part of our reality because of the stresses of the environment and the stresses of neoliberalism itself and the economic failures that we see around the world. So these are extremely dangerous and treacherous times. And we notice the stresses in political systems uh, as well. And I think we can all recognize that the uh, that U.S. policies in particular have become increasingly edgy and aggressive uh, around the world. So extremely dangerous uh, moment, uh, not to speak of other uh, powers uh, as well. Um, Oligarchy, hyper-concentration of capital, various point, absolutely uh, agree with it. State capture, yes, you think of Elon Musk, you think of uh, what's his name, the owner of Amazon, two guys competing with big rockets to fly, uh, Jeff Bezos. Uh, absolutely ridiculous um, posturing. Uh, and on your question, yes, I think the end point of neoliberalism is authoritarianism. I think, again, politically, this is an extremely... Uh, difficult uh, moment, but recognition of those patterns. What is neoliberalism? It's a thing that exists. What is it that it has done to democracy? What is it that it has done to alternatives? We need to recognize those patterns in order to be able to say, hey, we need to articulate something different. And it's not something um, that will come out of academic debates. We can't go to a conference and come out with a recipe. We can't uh, design, because we are so clever in universities, we're going to design a new political party that is going to represent, et cetera, et cetera. We, no, this is not our role, and it can't be done anyway. Our role as citizens is to join the movements we identify with and try to do something helpful, useful, and productive. Our role as social scientists is to cross fertilize experiences, is to say, I did this work here, I read those things, I thought these thoughts, I can uh, make systematic assessments of certain experiences and bring them to your, to your classes, to your lectures, to your movements, to your activities, and talk to people, and talk to people. And this is how we're going to, this is the only way to change the world. It's by convincing people and getting people interested in the problem and feeling empowered. But before empowerment has to come understanding, some form of understanding of the reality we are in, and the understanding that if you don't do something, the consequences will be absolutely dire. So. Uh, we do need to uh, mobilize and find ways of organization. Those ways of organization, this is an empirical problem. And it's for us, again, as social scientists, to observe different forms of mobilization and organization and identify successes and then say, ah, but there is this experience in country X that is interesting for you here. Think about that. Take notice. And we are in a very favorable position to do this kind of thing, to bring experiences together and bring people together, bring uh, views uh, together. 
How to make states more democratic, more progressive? Yes, in most of the global south, states were set up by the colonial powers, or they were set up in order to exploit their own populations for different, uh, in different ways and for different reasons. It, it, fundamentally, it will end up being the same problem as in the as in the global north. The problem is the problem of construction of social movements that can anchor political change. It will not happen just because we vote for candidate A instead of candidate B, because from the top, the constraints on public policy are very, very tight at this point in time. So without mass mobilization, it just is it's just not going to happen. The case of China that you mentioned, I agree entirely. China has done extraordinarily interesting things. Um, and in terms of climate policy, it's absolutely a leading country, not just in terms of generation of renewable uh, energy. I, I, I was uh, I went to uh, in, in China a few years ago, and they took me to see a desert that was not a desert anymore. It had been planted over decades. People went there to plant trees in organized ways. And what used to be desert, and you had the photographs to show, it wasn't a desert anymore. It was bush. It was an incredible mass project that could only be led by public policy within the context of a political authoritarianism. But China is not a neoliberal country anyway. So the principles and the and the action and the scope for success are, uh, are very different. In the case of neoliberal economies in the majority of the world, and, and it's certainly in the West, without democratization of the public uh, sphere, I worry that nothing is going to happen. We're going to be skidding. And we don't have 300 years. If we had 300 years, we could say, OK, something is going to happen and something is going to work out in the end. We don't have that time. So we need a strong state and we need a democratic state as well. And the only way forward that I can see is through uh, mass movements. How to communicate with, uh, with the youth? This is the $300 billion uh, question, because the young generation today do not have the experience of radical political change. There are no examples of radical transformation since when? Since the Iranian revolution, and then it, there was a collapse of the Soviet bloc, but that was not something that uh, will be particularly informative for, um, for the youth uh, of today. So the perception of the possibility of radical change uh, is an experience that is lacking and that has to be rebuilt and has to be regained and I worry, my concern, and I'll, I'll finish on this, is that we don't have much time for those experiences to bed down and for us to develop the ambitions and the modes of activity uh, and to gain uh, the traction that we need in practice. And But that this is the race that we are in, and we have to win it in order to have the possibility of a recognizable form of life on this planet by the end of this century. This is the timeline of people who are already around today. These, these are the kids that you see on the street today. They will be around by the end of the century. They will experience a world that is dramatically different from the world that we are experiencing right now and that it has already changed from uh, even a couple of decades uh, ago. So the urgency is enormous, and I think it's worth spending time thinking about these challenges and what can we do to contribute in practice? What efforts can we make? I think that's the great challenge for all of us uh, individually. Thank you, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh...